Good morning, everyone, and welcome. My name is Ryan Berg, and I'm a senior fellow with the Americas program at CSIS. Thank you for joining us today for this event on trust, the key to social cohesion and growth in Latin America and the Caribbean. Before we formally begin, let's take care of some logistics. The event will last approximately 60 minutes. Following the panelists' remarks and a moderated discussion, we will field questions from the audience. Please submit questions by clicking on the Ask Live function, Ask Live Questions link on the event webpage, or add them to the Q&A section of the webinar. Again, good morning. Thank you for joining us today for the event on Trust, the Key to Social Cohesion and Growth in Latin America and the Caribbean, a book published by scholars at the Inter-American Development Bank. Trust is essential in any community or nation to generate a foundation for inclusive growth and productivity. In Latin America and the Caribbean, trust levels have fallen dramatically from 22% in the 1980s to 11% in the 2010s. Between 2010 and 2022, fewer than three out of 10 Latin American and Caribbean citizens trusted their governments. Citizens often lack the means to hold their governments accountable and demand better public services. As such, rampant opportunistic behavior, unkept promises, human rights violations, and efforts to undermine transparency are challenges confronting the region. The imperative of social cohesion to generate an economic growth, the importance of trust to effective public policy, and the power of information and transparency are vital issues that need to be urgently addressed. When trust is low, compliance with rule of law and community engagement will also suffer. To facilitate and restore trust and make information accessible, the Inter-American Development Bank is generating key paths to strengthening education and regulatory institutions, reducing barriers to entry in the private sector and at a broader level, encouraging governments to fulfill their promises. Today, we are pleased to host an outstanding duo of speakers to discuss their book uh, on trust and provide us with insights on building trust and bolstering social cohesion. Our first speaker is Philip Kiefer, Principal Economic Advisor at the Inter-American Development Bank. Prior to this, he served as leading research economist in the Development Research Group of the World Bank. His research focuses on issues like the impact of insecure property rights on economic growth, the effects of political credibility on policy, the sources of political credibility in democracies and autocracies, and the influence of political parties on conflict, political budget cycles, and public sector reform. And our second speaker is Carlos Scartacini, head of the development research group at the research department and leader of the behavioral economics group of the Inter-American Development Bank. He has published eight books and more than 60 articles in academic journals and edited volumes. He is a member of the executive committee of the IDB's Gender and Diversity Lab, associate editor of the academic journal Economia, and founding member of La CES Brain or Behavioral Insights Network. I want to congratulate both of you on the publication of a really fascinating book, and I want to give the floor to Mr. Kiefer for opening remarks. Ryan, thanks a lot for the generous introduction, and thanks very much to CSIS for inviting us to give this presentation. We're excited about it and honored to be here. Uh, Carlos and I uh, have been working on this book for a few years on trust, the key to social cohesion and growth in Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, and you might ask yourself, uh, how is it? that how is it that an international development agency is working on a book about trust it seems like a topic that's a little bit distant from the usual the usual fare the usual development and policy work that that we're so familiar with and the argument that we make in this book is that in fact trust is fundamental to the development objectives that we usually pursue we're looking in the region to solve the problem of unproductive smes and we think trust is in the area of, of being fundamental to that solution. We want to reduce infor informality. We would like more investment, more innovation. We'd like to see greater participation in global, regional, and value chains. All of these are fundamental to Vision 2020 of the, of the IDB. But we'd also like to see more political stability and less populism in the region. Trust plays a huge role in all of those things. Um, these are issues we talk about continually through the book. And, but fundamentally, of course, we're driven by development, but the germ of this book was, um, was planted in 2019 when we saw uh, unrest in the region, unrest which hasn't, hasn't quite died down. The book argues for two paths 
through which trust influences or determines inclusive growth. Because at the end of the day, we are a development organization, we are development economists, and we're looking to accelerate inclusive growth in the region. There's the two paths are direct and indirect. The direct path is familiar from uh, lots of literature, Ronald Coase and Douglas North, Francis Fukuyama. And it basically says that if you want to transact in the economy, if you want to invest, you need trust. If you don't trust your transacting partner, if you don't trust the government not to expropriate your investment, there will be less economic activity and growth will be slower. Trust is fundamental then directly for inclusive growth. But a big contribution of the book is to highlight the indirect path from trust to inclusive growth, because the other component of growth is not just trust that individual actors have in each other or in the state. Trust, uh, the inclusive growth also depends on institutions and public goods and regulations, all of which lay the groundwork for inclusive growth. So if we want high quality infrastructure, if we want efficient regulations that control externalities without imposing undue harm on the incentives of investors and economic actors, we need good institutions, good regulatory framework. So that's the arrow up on top. But where do those come from? Those depend on acts of citizenship. Those depend on the collective action of citizens to support these public goods. And that in turn demands trust because all of these things require citizens to make individual sacrifices in pursuit of the public good, paying their taxes, obeying regulations, not being informal. These are all crucial, um, crucial contributors, building blocks of public goods and strong institutions. But if citizens do not trust each other, they will not believe that other citizens will make those sacrifices and will have no interest in making those sacrifices themselves. So trust is at the root of citizenship and citizenship and social cohesion are what give us the public goods and strong institutions we need to develop. So what is it that we mean by trust? Uh, we've thought a lot about this, uh, and there's many different ways to, to think about it, but we think this definition that really runs throughout the book and undergirds our, our, our analysis captures the most anal analytically and sort of policy relevant factors uh, that, uh, that are relevant for trust. The idea is trust is the belief that others will not act opportunistically. So what does that mean? Who are these others? These others are everyone. They're people, they're firms, they're governments. And when they do not act opportunistically, it means they do not make promises they cannot keep. They do not renege on promises that they can keep. And they don't violate norms to take advantage of those who respect them. And so we think that concept of trust really has a lot of mileage in, in serving as a foundation for the argument that I just outlined. So thank you, Ryan. Thank you, CSIS, for organizing this and for the kind words. Uh, just continue, you know, as, as Phil was saying, and, and Ryan was, was, was highlighting at the beginning, trust is very important for inclusive growth, but trust is extremely low in Latin America and the Caribbean. Here in this graph, we can see what we call interpersonal trust, where we trust others, we trust, you know, we trust each other. And as you can see, in Latin America and the Caribbean, basically one out of 10 people say that they can trust others. So one out of 10 people say that, you know, others will not act opportunistically. In other words, nine out of 10 people in Latin America and the Caribbean say that others will take advantage of them, will cheat if given the opportunity. Clearly, this is very different in the OECD countries. As you can see, it's almost, you know, almost half of the people think that they can trust others. And if you, if you look at the distribution, you know, there are countries you know, developed countries in which, you know, almost eight or nine out of 10 people trust uh, in each other. As you can imagine, you know, the way transactions can be, can be, you know, can, can occur in those economies is very different uh, in, than in, the, in Latin America, in which, you know, we are going to be, you know, trying to prevent others from taking advantage of us, and that is going to take, you know, generate a lot of transaction cost, you know, I, I, and so on and so forth. But this is not, you know, if we see the next one, this is not something that is happening right now. It is not a problem of one country in one year. This is not, you know, Chile 2019 or Venezuela 2017 or Argentina 2000. This is unfortunately a problem that the region has been facing for a very long time. This at least, you know, according to the data 
that is available for the last four years, Latin America and the Caribbean has had lower interpersonal trust than, than the rest of the world, and in particular than the, you know, than the developed countries. And unfortunately, this is a trend that is not changing and actually is, uh, is increasing uh, over time. So this, this mistrust. We are not, not doing better regarding trust in the government. Less than one in three Latin American and the Caribbeans think that they can trust uh, the government. Again, this is much lower than the rest of the world and other regions uh, in the world. Again, this is a context in which it's very difficult uh, to operate, to make transactions, uh, to go about you know, our, our daily life. The, the question now is why? Why is that Latin America and the Caribbean has such a low trust? And you know, in our analytical framework, basically we, um, that you know, comes from that definition that Phil was, was presenting before. Clearly trust you know, is low when there are what we call two things, information asymmetries and power asymmetries. That is, you know, it's easier for somebody to cheat to take advantage of you if they have more information than you, or if they have more power than you than you have. And, and in general, you know, when information is scarce, people cannot distinguish between good luck or bad luck, or where there is opportunistic behavior, again, and trustful. And also, you know, unreliable behavior, if it's not punished, then, you know, even if people is, is informed, then also is going to lead to mistrust. Just think about, you know, very easy examples. There is this, this example I tend to use a lot because, you know, us economists, you know, grew up with them with this, the, the case of the used cars, no? And, and, and the, you know, the sales of used car, you know, the person who is selling a used car has a lot of information about the car, uh, but the person who is buying does not. So clearly, you know, there are a lot of opportunities for cheating, uh, uh, you know, in this, in this transaction. So, you know, as we are going to be talking later, later on, probably, you know, what you need to do basically is to reduce the information asymmetry. So what we used to do is that we will take the car to a, you know, friendly mechanic that will provide us the information. So we're reducing the information asymmetries uh, and so on. And now there are other ways that we can do it. There is these things that is like car fax where we can go and look if the car was involved in an accident. Et so, so there are ways to reduce. So basically what we say is that in Latin America, there are huge information and power asymmetries and they come in grand part, you know, in a big part from our from our history. Okay, so we have a history of colonialism, slavery and forced labor, violent conflict. You know, they have all left a legacy of distrust, uh, and we know that there is persistence. Unfortunately, we know that you know once you you have uh, these episodes, then you know we know that parents you know leave this you know uh, mistrust into their kids. You know, there is you know it's not it's not random that you know when we when we are, you know, little, you know, the first thing that, you know, we are told is that, you know, don't talk to strangers, you know, don't accept candies from strangers, et cetera, et cetera. So those are attitudes that are, you know, past generation to generation. And clearly they are more common, you know, in, in, untrusty, in untrusty environments. And of course, you know, inequalities in the distribution of power and, and, and assets have also undermined ties and have also, you know, not allowed for um, uh, institutions that reduce information and power asymmetries to, um, uh, to flourish. Great, thank you so much, Phil and, and Carlos for your opening remarks and, and for giving us a really uh, good picture of, of the, the thrust and the, the general arguments of, of the book. I wanna drill down now in a moderated portion of the discussion on, on some of these pieces and, and get to a more nuanced level. Talk about the one of the things that I think is most interesting about the book is this nexus that the two of you make between uh, be between interpersonal trust and trust in government and institutions, which had previously been been thought of as as two separate things. Um, so talk about that process. What's the nexus between those things? You have interpersonal trust, which was thought to be separate from trust in government and institutions. Uh, prior to some of the work that, that you're drawing on. So what, what are the processes by which these two things are, are connected, that you have an interpersonal lack of trust and you sort of project that onto uh, government and institutions? And I, I put this question out there for either one of you or both of you. Thanks. Thanks, Sarah. Ryan. The, um, 
uh, we, we really like this connection that we draw in the book. We don't think it's very common. Uh, sort of, it's a, it's a contribution we think we're making. Uh, and the idea is this, if governments are not performing, um, if you can't do anything about government, like if they don't perform well, they act opportunistically, they steal, they, they screw up the economy, whatever, they abuse their power. If you don't think that you can sanction governments for doing that, for en engaging in that behavior, then as a consequence, you know that they're going to engage in it and you're not going to trust them. What does it take to prevent governments from acting that way? It takes collective action by citizens. Citizens have to say, no, we are collectively going to kick out this government and elect a new one. We won't let ourselves be dissuaded by vote buying or by individual promise to some of us so that we continue to support this government that is in fact not doing a good job for us as a collective, as us as a nation. So trust in government depends on this capacity to be able to punish governments that don't do a good job. Uh, that depends on collective action, but collective action, this idea of citizenship that we were talking about demands interpersonal trust. It demands that everybody sort of does their part and without that trust, people don't think they're going to do it. So we think that that's, that's the essence of the, of the relationship. We think that relationship can be strengthened when there's more, more community organization, maybe stronger political parties, maybe these are, these are all manifestations of overcoming these collective action problems or, or, and, and beginning to be able to, to hold government accountable in a more systematic way, thereby building trust in government. Excellent. Thanks, Phil. Carlos, do you want to weigh in on this? Yeah, you know, I think I think Phil, Phil, you know, answered it, it great. I think that you know, just let's let's bring it to the, you know, the, the the arrow from the, you know, if you don't trust the government, you cannot trust other, you know, in very easy terms. In the sense that, you know, for example, if you don't trust the police, if you don't trust that the police is going to, you know, be there to help you in case of somebody who wants to take something from you, clearly you are not going to trust others because. You know the the, the the opportunity is there for others you know to to take advantage of you uh, if you don't trust that the you know that the local health agency is able to inspect you know restaurants and and the quality of the food that you are going to be consuming well you know it's less likely that you are going to you know safely go out and and, and eat and eat outside and again just a recent example if you don't trust that there is a good regulatory body that is going to test check whether the vaccines are, are you know are, are safe or not clearly the probability that you are not going to to trust the manufacturers you also goes up so so clearly you know you cannot separate uh, both uh, both concepts and i think that before us you know more or less you know you had the scholars that were looking at interpersonal trust and you know the punnams of this world you know we're trying to think about social cohesion about you know atomization and then you have the scholars looking at uh, trusting government, looking at corruption, etc., but without understanding or without putting together the fact that you cannot have one without having the other. It's it's not a coincidence that um, you know in, in countries where political parties are are weak and sort of they they appear one day and they're gone the next day, um, or they're they're organized around individual politicians, which is pretty common in the region. Uh, it's no coincidence that those are places where trust in government is low because political parties are one way in which people can organize themselves to hold governments accountable. Thank you both very much. It, it, as you both said, I think this is an interesting and, and really novel contribution that you're making uh, in the book. So I wanted to, to drill down on that. Um, I wanted to go uh, in my next question to the really interesting slide that you had um, showing historically ebbs and flows in trust. Uh, in, in Latin America, showing that this is not a problem that's somehow new or somehow cropped up in the last couple of years. Latin America has had a lower baseline level of trust um, for, for, for decades now. And, and um, thinking about that slide, I wanted to ask you, uh, is there a sort of minimum level of trust uh, that, that is requisite for, um, for robust institutions and, and for government to, to function well. And, and, and let me tell you where my question is coming from. We had democratic uh, governance in Latin America, robust democratic governance in the 80s and in the 90s and in the, the early 2000s, as Latin America was riding what Huntington, of course, called the third wave of democracy. Um, then we saw in that graph that trust went down a little bit. And, and there you know, started some of the, the, the problems. 
Um, is there sort of a minimal baseline? And I guess, how do we explain that explosion in what looked to be at the time robust democracy in Latin America if trust levels were always at a pretty low baseline? So there's two questions there. The, um, so I'll, I'll, take a, I'll take a shot at part of it, I think. The, um, uh, so we, we don't have a lot to say about bursts and, and drops in, in trust over, over time. That's a, that's, a hard, that's a hard question to answer. We can easily imagine the euphoria of, of democracy in the sense of free elections after a period of, of dictatorship, because after all, you had no possibility whatsoever of holding a dictatorship accountable, and all of a sudden, you can vote, you can actually take part in your own governance. So it wouldn't surprise us at all if the advent of democracy, the, the advent of this possibility of holding governments accountable increases trust in government. But we also know that that's not enough. Elections are not enough because people can people's votes can be influenced by many things. Um, and people need to have confidence that others are, are together with them trying to evaluate politicians along on the same basis um, and not being swayed by sort of individual offers of clientelist promises and vote buying. And maybe as time goes on, those other influences become more important and people begin to, to, lose, to lose confidence in, in their ability to hold governments accountable and, and you get sort of a, a malaise. The, um, I think I forgot the other part of your question, but the... But maybe Carlos did that. <laughs> it was sort of, it, you know, is there a minimal level of of trust uh, that that we that we ought to have um, for government institutions to quote unquote function well, however that might de be defined? Uh, is it the OECD level? Is it even higher? Obviously, we would love trust to be, you know, at the top of of the chart. Um, but you know, being realistic, is ha have you discovered in some of your research that there's sort of a a, a minimal uh, standard of trust uh, below which we start to see some of the challenges that we've seen in, in Latin America, or is it much more contextual? Oh, it, it, it's, it's a fascinating question, and you know we haven't we haven't studied in in, in the in you know in the, in detail you know to say oh you need you know point two point twenty five point thirty, but there is something that is true. Uh, which is which is the following when you think about the you know the more historical literature in the sense that and there were you know most in most countries you know you had an elite that was ruling at some point you know in the in the in the in the in the movement towards towards democracy it may have happened 300 years ago or 400 years ago or may have happened you know 40 years ago so clearly you know the transition you know the the transition clearly in a way, the way the institutions, you know, are created, you know, during the transition, it needs trust. You know, the, the elites need to trust that, you know, if they hand over power, clearly, you know, they are going to, you know, no, nobody, nobody is basically going to use that power just to strip all the, you know, all their assets or, or whatever. So there are certain levels of trust that you need, uh, do need in order to build institutions. I think that, that one of the reasons that we are saying is that we have this original sin you know, we come from colonialism, slavery, forced labor, violent conflict that clearly creates the conditions for mistrust. Uh, and there were, you know, and, 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 and unfortunately, we were not able to create the institutions that were needed to reduce this information asymmetry, this power asymmetry. Quite on the contrary, in many countries, the institutions that were created during the transition basically sustained these power asymmetries. Okay. And, and you know, and these power asymmetries, you know, that stay in power, they, you know, maintain the, you know, the, the income inequality, the wealth inequality, etc. So, so clearly, clearly, there is there is something uh, out there for the creation of institutions. But also today, you know, when we have done more research and we have done much more research now, you know, how do, how do we increase trust? And, and you know, and, and we may we may enter into details later, but you know, we have all of these these. Um, experiments in which we provide information to people, governments provide information showing that they can do a good job, etc. Clearly, what you will see is that most of the reaction, most of the movement towards greater trust happened in those citizens that already have a little bit of trust. So when they receive the information, you know, they, they read the information, they process the information, and they, you know, they change your, their belief accordingly. There is a certain group that mistrust absolutely, you know, in, in absolute terms, that there is no amount of information that you can give them to sway them that you are a good government. 
you know, or that you are trying to do the good policy. So that's a that's a, that that's an issue. And let me just what, add one last thing that that I think that I I wish we 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 had research a little bit more, which is the impact of uh, external shocks, which 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 we think, or at least I think I, I don't want to put feel feeling this, but I, you know, well, we we think that that you know Latin America historically has been a region affected by external shock. You know, we have the highest term of, terms of trade volatility. So it murkies, you know, the signals that, you know, good economic outcomes could give you regarding good policies. So, you know, most voters will look at, you know, uh, economic outcomes and try to establish a relationship with the policy. But if you are, you know, if you are being constantly hit by external shocks, then it's more difficult, you know, to make that connection because, you know, somebody's telling you that these are good policies, but now you have bad economic outcomes, or somebody's telling that you're, you know, these are bad policies, and now you're having good economic outcomes, and, and and I think that it also makes it hard in Latin America to signal as a politician that you are, you know, what we call a good tie, that you are, you know, a person who has, you know, the the, the common interest uh, in, in in mind. No? I just want to just add one little thing. Uh, somebody famous whose name I forget said, "If you wanna, if you wanna find out if you can trust someone, trust someone." <laughs> Uh, if you want to inspire trust in you and others, trust them. And, and I think uh, that ha we're seeing that on the world stage, actually, um, because I think no one would have thought Ukraine, for example, would have been able to mount such a huge defense because it was not known as a place with high social capital, high trust in government, high interpersonal trust. And yet, amazingly, um, what happened? They're holding fast. And, and part of that is at some point the government says we trust our armed forces. We, we, will, we trust that we were going to delegate authority to our armed forces to defend our country. So they're trusting them to, to operate independently. That's a, a terrible problem for a dictator. Dictators don't like to do that. And we're seeing that on the other side. Uh, in fact, we're seeing a whole organization of military effort based on not trusting your soldiers. So that's substituting artillery for soldiers, substitute not trusting, not delegating, getting a lot of disaster on the ground. Um, so I, I just think trust, Governments that trust can 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 get a lot of action. Uh, so they can bring low levels of, even in low le, low trust societies. If governments start trusting, they can they can build trust and and increase efficacy and effectiveness. Thank you both uh, for for your answers. Let's get into some of the solutions because because those were mentioned uh, in in both of your responses. Um, some governments in Latin America and the world at large are operating according to what I've called in some of my publications, a playbook, a shared playbook, which includes corruption networks and the nurturing of, of cronyism and so forth. So um, as scholars at the IDB, you're obviously sharing um, information about your research, findings of your research. Um, how can opportunistic and corrupt behavior be curbed? What are some of the top recommendations that you give to governments when you make your presentations? The, the, the big picture is, is what we've been talking about. I mean, the big picture is, look, it, opportunistic behavior by governments is sort of like taking rents or, or just you know malfeasance, misfeasance, nonfeasance. Uh, and, and that creates a common problem for citizens, like a collective problem for citizens, but it doesn't create an individual problem for any individual citizen. So the only way that citizens can solve this collective problem, which is governments that are stealing or whatever, is to act collectively to prevent it. But governments that steal are pretty good at sort of dividing and conquering, um, in, uh, of paying some people off so that they, that they don't join the opposition or whatever. Uh, and to resist that, you need trust in the citizenry. You need trust that, that and, and that's why community organization and political parties and so forth are important. So that's the big picture. That's not something we're doing uh, that international agencies do. Um, instead, we, we really push on the transparency front. Uh, we say, look, let's organize, let, let's organize government affairs so that people know what's going on, so that it's harder, so that it's easier for them to, to, to fix this information asymmetry, because part of it is a power asymmetry. So powerful people can steal because they're powerful, but part of it is they can get away with it because they can hide it. So we work hard on solving the information asymmetry side, just for one you know, small, but interesting and, and, and in its domain, big example, 
is this thing called Mapa Regalias that we've been working on. And that's basically putting online where the infrastructure spending is going in a country, along with the projects that are associated with it. So anybody can click on a, uh, a needle on a map online and see, okay, this is how much money is going for the infrastructure project. Here's the status of that project. People can take pictures and say, no, no, it's not like that, and post those. Uh, and so it creates a nice feedback loop um, that, that allows people to, to know that you know, things are proceeding. And if there were massive corruption associated with the spending, they wouldn't be proceeding and it would be detected. That doesn't solve the power asymmetry problem. Um, you know, People not only have to know, but they have to be able to act. But it's, uh, we would say it's a necessary condition for, for pushing back on these problems. And the other thing that we do is just support um, as best we can independent organization, independent state agencies that, um, that, pursue, that pursue corruption. Uh, and the third thing we do is really work with countries to subscribe to another kind of shared playbook, which is like no money laundering and you know avoiding these sort of trans transnational uh, corrupt acts that that make domestic um, corruption more easy. So we're quite involved in that as well. Just great, just, thanks, Phil. Carlos. No, just to add a little bit. Again, you know, as you were saying, we need to find ways to reduce the information and power asymmetry everywhere. So just inform you know and, and empower that's you know that's that's the way to but there is there is something that we are saying over and over and over that i hope that you know at the end of the day if anybody you know you know only, only remembers one thing out of out of our work is that we need to make trust a, an objective an explicit objective of public policy okay that we haven't we haven't done it we haven't done it in the in, in the past and and we are not doing it now so clearly you know in the in the public policy side, we have all of these objectives. You know, we want to increase growth, we want to increase investment, we want to increase great development. Uh, okay, but you need trust in order to to generate all of that. And unfortunately, in many cases, in many countries, we undermine trust in the pursuit of some of these policies. It's very common, you know. Oh, we need this new, you know, this firm to exploit X and X. So let's violate the rules or let's make an exception this time, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, so that is going to uh, uh, to you know backfire in the in the long run and even politicians you know when they go around and say that everybody else is corrupt you know no other politician other than me is you know it's not corrupt you know everything is bad everything okay so again even if if they win the election basically what they are doing is that they are planting the seeds of their own defeat because again you know if, if you are telling me that every politician is corrupt there is no reason why you know, you are not going to be in the sense that, you know, if the conditions are not changed uh, and unfortunately in the long run, you see that, you know, that even even those that run in an you know, anti-corruption platform, et cetera, et cetera, end up failing because, you know, they 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 plant the seeds of, of mistrust. So so I think that, again, understanding that this is something that we all have to work on and, and put it at the forefront of the of the public policy debate, I think is 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 the key number one. Yeah. You know, I, I hate to be always the coda to, sorry about this, but they, but there's things that we always do, but we do them for other reasons. And if we did them because of their effects on trust, we would, we and governments would pursue them with a lot more enthusiasm. So think about tax administration reform. It's sort of bread and butter of international agencies. It's bread and butter for governments, but what is the usual reason to do tax, uh, tax administration reform? It's collect more revenues. So nobody wants to, I mean, that's not popular. Collecting more revenues is not more popular. But what is the fundamental tenet of tax administration reform? It's treating everybody the same so that everybody has to abide by the rules. That does nothing but build trust. So if, if you think about tax administration reform as having as its primary objective building trust instead of increasing revenues, I think you get a lot more enthusiasm and, uh, and a lot more push. Or the same with boring things like improving public administration. I mean, that's never a popular item. It doesn't get votes. But what does public administration reform really allow you to do? It's not just efficiency, like let's have better human resources standards or better public sector financial management. It's actually increasing the capacity of governments to fulfill their promises because they get into office, they've made all these promises and they uncover and they, they encounter a public administration that's inefficient, unresponsive because of these, because of the nuts and bolts and plumbing really aren't working very well. So fixing the plumbing which nobody likes to do, is actually allowing the house to work. It's allowing the house to be livable. It's allowing governments to, to, to comply and fulfill their promises. Thank you both. And, and you've given me actually a great segue into my next question, which is a, it's about 
Uh, collective action. Some of the uh, choices that citizens have made in the region recently through their collection action, collective action seems to me uh, to, to mean populism. Um, and, and, you know, we've seen, in fact, how populist candidates, as Carlos alluded, have hijacked the narrative of trust, um, e even though in many ways it plants the seeds uh, for, for their own defeat or for their own challenges once, once they're in office. Um, so how is it that we can reduce the reasons, region's desire for political candidates that aim to, quote, fix it all? I will, I will, I will, I will take that this. Uh, so, so, so Phil doesn't have to. So clearly, clearly, you know, as, as we were saying, the reason why, why you are going to, you know, elect one of these candidates is because there is, there is mistrust. Okay. So when there is mistrust, you're going to go, you know, for the, for the individual that is promising you, you know, basically uh, individual transactions. Okay. The one that is going to go into promise one thing for each, for each individual, the one that is going to be, you know, providing you with a subsidy here or with a transfer here or with a, you know, price control here or a reduction here. You are not going in, in a context of mistrust. You are not going to be going for the candidate who is, pro, who is going to promise big infrastructure projects and, you know, things are going to happen in 20 years because you don't trust that those things are going to happen. So unfortunately, in a context of mistrust, it's very difficult for the candidates that hopefully, you know, will generate the, you know, the most long-term growth to, you know, to win. Because again, you know, let's say that, you know, you have, you have a candidate that is promising you improving exports, so building ports. So you have to, you know, first trust that, you know, he's going to build, the, he or she are, you know, is going to build the port, that, you know, they are going not to steal the money while they are building the port, that they are going to build the port in the right, in the right place, that they are going to be, you know, roads that are going to lead to the port, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you have, you know, there is a lot of demand for trust in one of those things. While if there is a person who comes and says, look, if I win, I'm going to give you a hundred dollars every month. Okay. Or I'm going to reduce the price of electricity or, you know, gas is going to be cheaper. And that's, and, you know, that's, that's, that's a transaction that more people are willing to make in a context of, of, of mistrust. Uh, and again, you know, and this also happens as Phil was saying, in a context in which you don't have political, you know, strong political parties. So it's easier, you know, for these candidates uh, to, to appear, you know, because, you know, there is no way for you to come collectively. So everybody, every individual is going to be looking for individual, individual transactions. So that's why you see, you know, you see a lot of things going on in a populist government, a lot of transfers going on in, in all directions. You know, everybody is getting something. Um, in the end, nobody's getting anything because it's just, you know, a huge, you know, putting a lot of money in, in a pot and, you know, redistributing again with a lot of, with a lot of dead weight losses, no? So that's that's a little bit of you know what what is what is going on. So we need to we need to elevate you know elevate trust. We need you know we need to create the conditions for candidates to you know to be able to make promises of you know good of good policies and then people to vote for us. Increasing information is important. Empowering individuals through you know strengthening civil society and strengthening uh, political parties is important. We have one example. In, in you know we you know one. You know, we work with the city of Buenos Aires, for example, and they are the mayor, may, you know, when, when he entered government, he made 50 promises. He said, these are the 50 things I'm going to do. And not only these are the 50 things I'm going to do, these are the targets I'm putting, you know, this is, you know, for each one of these 50, and I'm going to be tracking my performance over these 50, uh, over these 50 targets. Uh, and this was public. Okay, so it was very clear what his administration was going to do, and every citizen, every day, could track the performance uh, of the government. And we show in the, in the book uh, that providing that information, you know, making clear what your promises are and, you know, complying with those promises and, and informing the public that those promises were kept, you know, increases, increases trust a lot. And now you generate, you know, kind of a, 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 a positive cycle in which, you know, now the incentive for politicians is, is again, to go, to go that route, not to put the promises, comply with them and make them. So we need to generate it. But for that, you need to be transparent. You need to have systems, you know, to keep record of what you are doing, et cetera, et cetera. 
just to supplement or complement the so I, I feel like there's two flavors of populism one is more common in, in the region or we're, we're more worried about in the region uh, and carlos was talking about it it's basically people who promise who who say they're going to do policies today that are really going to create disaster tomorrow in a low trust environment everybody expects that there's going to be disaster tomorrow no matter who's in charge because everybody is going to take advantage so the the, the rational politician who's not populist doesn't have a competitive advantage he can't credibly promise to do good to do things that are going to protect the future because nobody believes it. So the populist politician naturally has an advantage. The other kind of populism is dividing people against each other, right? It's the sort of nationalist populism. I don't think that's as big a deal in, in Latin America, but it's pretty clear that the politician who's trying to divide the country or to set people against each other, and that's sort of a, a plain, uh, a big strategy of many populists. Is going to have a harder time doing that if people in the society trust each other and he's going to have an easier time doing it if they don't trust each other so naturally populist politicians can make things worse but it's easier for them to enter in low trust environments great i think that's a super important point that you just made uh phil about the expectations of people for 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 bad policies and for, even for disastrous policies and the uh, the advantage that some populist politicians have really really important point I want to remind um, our viewers, uh, audience members, that if you want to ask a question, we'll get to the Q&A in, in just a few short minutes. There's a Q&A box at the bottom of our Zoom screen. There's also the Ask Live Questions function on the CSIS uh, web page, and we're filtering uh, questions um, throughout this event, and we've actually gotten about four or five of those. So I just want to ask one more question before we jump into Q&A uh, to both of you, Phil and, and Carlos. And it came from Carlos's comment about um, external shocks and external shocks being a, a very important part uh, of Latin America, being a region that is, is, is often, uh, Latin America and the Caribbean, being a region that is, that is often prone to, uh, to, to effects from external shocks. One of the most uh, significant external shocks that we've all experienced in the last couple of years is obviously COVID and the fallout from, from COVID. And I think we're starting to see now a picture of what a, a post-COVID um, trust environment looks like. Uh, but I, before we jump into Q&A, I want to ask both of you just to, to ruminate for a second on this um, and, and give us your thoughts on uh, what is COVID going to do to levels of trust in Latin America longer term than we've seen so far, right? We've been observing for maybe you know one election cycle or so. Um, longer term, what, what are some of your, uh, of your predictions, if I can ask you both to kind of put your prognostication hats on for a second um, and, and, and just think, because this is, you know, huge external shock um, and, and I think has a lot to do with, with trust. Um, so I, I'll, I'll just say something brief so Carlos can think about the really good answer. The, um, the, I, I feel like we don't, what is the problem with a huge shock like this? The problem, the, the issue with a huge shock like this is, is people's expectations about how well government and their co you know, the other citizens should have been able to respond to it. So I actually think, and so public health experts, their trust in governments all over the world is just disastrous because public health experts, I think, had very, um, very high expectations about what government could and should have done. And I'm thinking, um, governments and societies have a really hard time dealing with things like this. Uh, they never have an easy time dealing with it. You're asking for massive change in behavior, really earth-shaking change in behavior by everybody in a low information environment. And I feel like uh, you can't, you're not going to get that very often. So I think the world did not a, a bad job <laughs> in this sense. So I don't know how people in Latin America are thinking about it. If they think that their governments could have done a thousand times better, then trust has collapsed. Uh, but if they think we're all in this crappy situation together and we all did the best we could, then I think trust is relatively unchanged. They're going to be worried about other things. And I think that could be same, the same could be said for practically any country or region. Carlos? Yeah, no, I think I think I think that you know Phil's answer is, is, is very good. I think that, you know, I I, th I think, you know, we don't know yet. We, we know that, you know, trust was very, very important for how people react, no? Clearly, you know, and, and, and we have that in the book and, you know, there are plenty of, of papers written about, you know, you know, how likely it was that people will accept, you know, mobility restrictions according to trust, how likely it was that people were 
going to you know get vaccinated according to levels of trust. So we know that trust play a major role uh, during during COVID. Uh, we don't know exactly you know how how people are going to react. I think that Bill's answer is perfect. What we know is what happens with other type of shocks, and we have done some research about that. For example, with natural shocks. So what happened after an earthquake? What happened about you know after a tsunami? What happened you know? Uh, and it's clearly in line with, with what Phil was was mentioning. Basically, you have cases in which trust plummets because people think that the government you know so so part of the part of the of the fault is in, in the government because you know let's say that the a building code was not good enough, you know, in a zone of of of, of uh, an earthquake, or you know, actually the fact that the earthquake, you know, makes it clear where the building code was good or not. So clearly, in some in some cases, plummets. In other, it doesn't. Act quite on the contrary, people see that the government reacts and provides help, etc. So 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 trust actually increases. And the same with people. You know, you have certain disasters in which people come together. You know, and people react as a community and trust increases and you have other disasters in which, you know, people start looting each other uh, and taking advantage and then and then trust, uh, trust happens. I think that the first indications we are getting from the region is of a high heterogeneity. Uh, countries that have kind of, you know, come together and everybody's getting vaccinated and everybody kind of reacts positively to, you know, to the different waves and countries in which, unfortunately, Basically, trust has you know has has dropped so much that you know nobody gets vaccinated, nobody cares anymore about the about this, etc. Thanks, Carlos. Thanks, Phil. Let's jump into the Q and A. We're getting a bunch of questions, and that that's great. That means we we've provoked uh, audience members uh, to to ask questions and to to try to delve down with us deeper. So, I've got a, a short question to start us off in the, the Q&A, and that is uh, one for either one of you, if you want to chime in, is simply, what is the role of the private sector in building trust? Um, something we we perhaps haven't touched on uh, completely yet uh, in, in this event. So that's for either one of you. The private sector is just people, right? I mean, we're just talking about firms doing their thing. So I, I feel like, um, the, how you build trust as an individual or as a firm is to is to be trustworthy. Um, so that's at the at the individual level. Um, so firms that and, and I think that one aspect of public policy that could really help that in in Latin America is increasing focus on competition because uh, firms that are operating in a more competitive environment pay a greater price for acting opportunistically towards their customers or towards their providers or towards their workers. People have options. So when people have more options in the private sector, I expect behavior by the private by private sector firms, by their trustworthiness should, should increase. Um, so that's there's a public policy aspect there. And then there's just a being a good citizen aspect to this as well. Uh, and then the third thing is, you know, this is asking a lot because everybody is looking out for themselves and that's a natural thing. But the more the private sector or individuals are looking for special treatment uh, for themselves in public policy or in other, on, in other areas, the less trustworthy they will be perceived uh, by, the, by the rest of the society. Great, very succinct answer. Phil, anything to add, Carlos? No, no. I think that you know we we. I think I think again this 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 is this is the right. The, those are the right the right answers. I think that the only thing I, I I can add to the to the competition, which you know is very valuable, is the role of you know super, supervision and regulatory agencies. Clearly, that you know they have they have a huge role to play because as you know we see them as uh, institutions that inform and empower. No, clearly, clearly, you know as, as I was giving a, an example earlier no when we have the if you have the local health uh, authority you know provides information about the restaurants the quality of the food the you know the cleanness of the kitchen etc that clearly helps to create an environment that is that is easier for customers uh, to live in when you have a good regulatory agency that is controlling that the your you know your phone your mobile phone company is not charging you exorbitant amounts for you know for a lot of things clearly you know clearly that also creates Better conditions for competition and for you know for inf for for informed ca customers etc. So so you know there is a big role we think for regulatory agencies here. 
But I, I guess just to, I mean, this is a very interesting topic. So, so you'd also like to see, you know, the private sector or, or wealthier people in a society uh, have more capacity to make political donations. That's true everywhere. You would like to see sort of political activity dedicated towards political groups that have the, the, the broad welfare of society more in, in their interest, that have the future of the country more in their interest. I, I think it's just harder in the region, partly for the reasons of external volatility that Carlos talked about, to get private firms to think uh, long term and broadly because the horizons are relatively short, just because the rates of return need to be very high, the future is dim, it's volatile. Um, so I think that's so it's sort of good fiscal policy that's sustainable and keeps things less volatile could be a trigger for the private sector to take a, a greater interest in um, in more sustainable in, in political candidates and political parties that pursue more sustainable policies. Great, that's an excellent uh, set of ideas, Phil and Carlos. So I wanna move on to the, the second one, which is someone who's asking, and the question seems to me, someone who might be a little bit feeling a bit overwhelmed uh, about, about the um, uh, what needs to, to happen in, in, the, in the region, but he asks, how, how do we start building trust in Latin American countries with historical grievances and inequalities now with polarization and frequent corruption news. When we get corruption news, we tend to uh, think on the one hand, it's a, it's a good thing because of course we've unmasked it, we've brought transparency to, to uh, the situation, but we also see a, a decline in trust. So what would be the first step uh, to, uh, to, to bring us back onto a better path and where do you suggest that would come from? I think that again, realizing that trust has to be an explicit objective of public policy and politics. I think that that's if we if we you know are, are able to do that, I think that we are going to go a long way. I think again, uh, and 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 making politicians understand that in order to build trust, you have to empower, you have to create certain you know level playing fields, etc. If you are tinkering with the judiciary all the time and you are reducing the power of you know a third party enforcer. Uh, that's you know very very difficult. If you are, you know, changing the Supreme Court every time, that's not going to that's not going to happen. Actually, you know, you have to create you know a strong judiciary, a strong regulatory bodies, um, etc. I think that that's, those are some of the some of the conditions. And I think that I think we are reaching a point in which uh, it's you know th there was you know there was a big you know amount of wealth and there were a lot of unexploited opportunities for the region to be growing, but even though it was growing very low, but I think that right now, I think that I think as, as Phil was saying, I think that everybody has to realize that if we don't pull together, uh, things are not going to get better uh, by, by themselves. So I think that it's time for everybody to come together and realize that we need to build trust, and for building trust, we need a strong judiciaries, we need a strong institutions. Transparency is great, but we need also to you know empower those to do something about corruption. If we are only highlighting you know corruption and there is nothing going on you know about it uh, that's that's going to be difficult so so empowering you know creating the conditions for people to come together to hold you know governments accountable uh, i think i think it's very important anything I, to add phil i i don't have a lot to add to this i think it's a it seems like an overwhelming problem because it is a overwhelming problem i mean it is a it, this is difficult the i i think there's um there's two acts of will, both by citizens and by politicians that can help. Uh, I actually think the challenges may be greater in like the United States than in Latin America in some sense regarding polarization. But to the extent that citizens adopt um, a, an all or nothing position on issues that are important to them, so that if the other side wins, I lose, then naturally, naturally that's um, not a good basis for trust because everybody knows that the other side has, an, uh, has a big incentive to act opportunistically towards me. Um, and so that's that's not so great. Um, and politicians can feed into that or not. So I think it's kind of a, a, a social, an act of social will on the citizen side and the politician side to say, look, we're going to focus on those areas where we can make all of ourselves better off. Um, and I, and and then politicians contribute to that by saying yes, and we will do that. We will implement these policies, and we will uh, we will communicate to you what we're doing in terms of making everybody better off and raising all ships. Um, but if if politics gener you know if everybody wants politics to be a zero sum game, 
then it will be a zero sum game. And that's not a good basis for building trust. Let me, let me just jump in very, very quickly, Ryan, because it's, it's overwhelming. But sometimes there are certain small reforms that at least, you know, have made a lot of a difference, at least in the opposite direction, in the, in the, in the following sense. In order for, for us or for politicians, et cetera, to think about the long term and the long term consequence of their actions, they need to care about the long term. They, and they need to have the ability to make what we call intertemporal transactions that, you know, you and I can think about the future and, you know, can accept some cost today for, you know, better event than tomorrow. But in order for you, for you do that, it's like you, you need some like long term plays, like the political parties. You know, it's easier when there are political parties or they are going to be these two political parties. It's easier to come together because, you know, today I'm the government, but tomorrow you are going to be in the government. So how can we come together? When we pass reforms that weaken political parties or reduce party discipline, then we fragment every opportunity for this for these conversations to happen because the people that are there today are not going to be there tomorrow and the parties do not represent, you know, anybody. So, so sometimes, you know, we have to think about, again, you know, electoral systems, fragmentation of the, of the, of the, of the legislature, fi campaign finance laws, how do we increase political party discipline, et cetera, et cetera. So we start to create some actors who have some incentives to think about the long run and not only about what happens tomorrow. Thanks, Carlos. Uh, another question has come in about uh, one of the graphs that you had in your early slides. And it's how do you explain the inconsistency in overall trust and trust in government with OECD countries and the rest of the world? What is what, what's the the special sauce there? Sorry, why why is the OECD countries have a higher level of trust than why is the, why is the government? The trust in government graph look different than the trust in others, oh, okay. other people graph. Oh, okay. Exactly so. Oh, okay, sorry. sorry. So there, there are two things to say there. One is about measurement. So the way that interpersonal trust and, and trust in the government are measured are a little bit different, and that generates some differences in, 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 in levels. So don't take like, you know, it doesn't mean like, you know, because we have, you know, 11% interpersonal trust and 29% or 30% trust in government, that means like, you know, individuals trust the government three times more than other people. It's just, it's just a measurement thing that, that, you know, the way these questions are asked affects, uh, affects the levels. So that's, that's one thing. And the reason why, why there is this big difference probably in the OECD countries in terms of one is basically in terms of trusting the government, there are, there are a couple of outliers that are driving the, the, the averages down. There are, you know, I think that is Portugal and Greece, if, if I don't remember, you know, wrongly, I think it's just particularly Greece. I think that is, is, is doing very poorly in terms of trusting the government is driving the average down. But, you know, the overall distribution of the OECD countries uh, is, is very high. Most of the countries are high in terms of interpersonal trust. And most of the countries are high in terms of, of trusting the government. And this is particularly true for the Northern European countries, no? the, the Scandinavian countries, you know, Germany, et cetera, they are always in the upper tail of the distribution. And the more Latin countries tend to be in the, in the, in the lower tail of the distribution. Phil, anything to add? No, oh, that's, um, it's kind of a methodological question and Carlos is the right guy to answer. Exactly. <laughs> uh, okay. One, one last quick question for, for both of you, and uh, it is, is there a, a, any one singular reason that contributes to low trust in Latin America and the Caribbean more than any other reason, be it corruption, income inequality, or cultural factors, or is it difficult to weight the importance of these factors that produce lack of trust? Yes, it's difficult to weight them. So we really, um, we, we really can't say which of these things are, are, are mattering more. Indeed, I, I mean, if you think about the, the really deep roots of trust in history and, and, and economics, uh, it becomes even, even more intractable. We're, we're very comfortable saying, look, um, what, why do we answer this question? Why do we want to answer this question? We want to answer it so that we can get to policy solutions. Um, and we think it's uh, more effective to think about in, information asymmetries and power asymmetries as the basis, as the two pillars for designing public policies, rather than focusing on corruption or inequality or, or something like that, because we don't think there's any good evidence that says, if you get rid of inequality tomorrow, 
trust will rise. Or if you get rid of corruption tomorrow, trust will rise. We rather, we, we agree that the economic power asymmetries that are embedded in high inequality are relevant, but we're not sure that the policy measures that would get rid of inequality would necessarily solve those power asymmetries, just to give you, just to give an example. So we'd rather focus on the power asymmetries and on the information asymmetries directly. That's a great explanation. Carlos, anything to add? I'll give you the chance for the last word. No, no, just, you know, if, if it's the last word, just thank you, Ryan, and thank you everybody for the opportunity. Uh, yes, thank you. Great questions. Great, great, great. It was really fun. <laughs> great. Uh, well, I think, you know, we, we could have gone on, Carlos and Phil, for, for a long time, and obviously there's so much to discuss uh, with the book. Again, congratulations on a really timely publication that I would encourage all of our audience members uh, to go and read. We put a link to the book, uh, which is available online, the PDF version on the IDB website. We've got that link on the event webpage uh, if you want to head over there and find it. Again, Phil Kiefer, Principal Economic Advisor at the Inter-American Development Bank, and Carlos Scarcini, Head of the Development Research Group uh, and Leader of the Behavioral Economics Group at the IDB. Thank you so much for joining us this morning.